welcome back to another episode with Fight Night Picks. As always, we're brought to you by Simbody. Vertiball is now Simbody. If you head on over to their website, Simbody.com, you're going to get all the great products that you know and love, including the Simbody Vertiroller and the Vertiball that you have seen most likely here in studio. Look at that. Place it, lock it, attach it, Vertiball, all sorts of great stuff over there if you want to roll out those old tired muscles and you don't want to go with that old lacrosse ball. They are also coming out with that very new product that you can see right in front of you. And if I head on over to my cart, look at that. I've already got a Vertiball over there. A little bit of a deal right there. And if you hit the try for 60 days risk-free, use the promo code FNP and you're going to get 10% off your order. With that code FNP at Simbody.com, you're really really helping out another local company here in new brunswick canada can't wait for it the new name simbody at simbody.com and as we always say let's get into it a last look at the big card be sure to head into the chat and have your say let's get into it and join in fight night picks Question mark. Like that, we're back. We're getting set for a big time card. UFC 286 from London. 10.30 a.m. start here with Fight Night Picks. Matt, we operate in Eastern Time, but we're actually in the Atlantic Time Zone. And we're really excited and getting set for a big time card. And oh, I can't yeah. say that enough. You have this trilogy fight that's in the main event. You have a possible fight of the year on paper between Gaethje and Fazeev. A lot of bad blood there. And when you look down through this overall card, obviously we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty and all of the matchups. We only had one weight miss. It was fellow Canadian Malcolm oh. Gordon showing up 129.5. So listen, last weekend we obviously had, uh, you know, a couple of people missing weight. One guy really missing it, but it's obviously unfortunate to see that lucky day. Just got himself a sim body vertebral. So that's good to see. VT's hanging out, Eldar, Taylor, Christian, Eric morning, Cote, everybody. hot dogs. It is a early morning start. And Matt, again, this is a 15-fight card. There's a lot of things to try and digest. Six total debuts. You had 10 ranked fighters when we taped the videos back on Sunday. So a, a lot to really look forward to and a lot to kind of digest on this one. I gotta be honest, I always have a weird level of hype for these midday cards because I feel like it does take me a couple hours to really get into the rhythm of watching a big fight card. But it is kind of wild that in a few short hours we'll be watching Kamaru Usman fight Leon Edwards for kind of one of these legacy defining fights, you know? If Leon Edwards is able to beat Kamaru Usman, then I know we've kind of talked about it. GSP to me is still the go to the welterweight division. But Usman was starting to build quite the resume behind him. Now, if Edwards is able to beat Usman again, I think GSP is probably going to stay in that number one spot. But if Usman's able to beat Edwards for the second time now in three fights and then go on another nice streak, who's to say where Kamar Usman's going to end up kind of in the all-time great conversation? I just think this fight has a lot of real big implications for both guys' careers as a whole. Tough to say. Justin Frank setting up the Super Chat already. Billy slaps on that. Bruno Silva. We got Stan's MMA hanging out from Saskatoon. Old Toontown, Matt. Wow. Saskatchewan. Leon versus McGregor. Been to Saskatoon. It's a nice city. And yo, can you guys start keeping your stats? Yo, Gregory. We do keep our stats. They're below in Check the comments. Check the comments, bud. They're down in the description Just every it. single week. Uh, Steppen hitting up the Super Chat as well. So the Super Chat is doing... Thank you very much. Very well already. Much appreciated. Chandler Witt hanging out as well. If you can't toss out a Super Chat, that's all right. You can toss out a like. It is certainly appreciated. And what we always do with the show, Matt, as Taylor Christensen asks, you think Usman still fights after this? I feel it's a retirement no matter what happens tonight. Interesting. His knees look like Greg Oden knees when he's weighing in. I'll be honest, I haven't thought about that a lot. I, I have thought about the age and the miles, definitely, that are starting to gain on the body of Kamaru Usman, but it would be kind of wild to see him retire in the hometown of his opponent, you know? Like, this doesn't really feel like a farewell send-off kind of tort to me. If he does lose, maybe that is a separate conversation, but that is an interesting point you bring up. Maybe there is a world where he goes out there, beats Leon Edwards, hopefully the hometown gives him kind of the respect that he deserves, and he just calls it a quits. That would be interesting. Clay, hang out there, as well as Austin and the Salmon as we always do with the show 
We toss it on over to the fight of the night screen. Gaethje taking on Chandler. Lightweight fight. madness and lightweight Todd fight of the years before. I mean, Gaethje listen, taking on Chandler. Gaethje taking on Fazeev. Gaethje taking on Chandler was a fight great. of the year. I just watched it, so it's still burned into my mind. But Gaethje, when he fought Michael Johnson, when he came in 2017, that was a double bonus feature. He's had two fights that have won double bonuses, 10 total uh, you know, performance bonuses and fight of the night bonuses combined for Gaethje in his six and four UFC career for Fazeev. He just continues to stack up bonuses in every performance. Fazeev's last time out, fifth round knockout of the legend, the GOAT. Eh. But for me, he's a Hall of Famer oh, in yeah. uh, Rafael Dos Anjos. Samat, Fazeev taking on Gaethje. I absolutely love this fight. Steven saying, people underrating Gaethje still think Rafael wins, but very close. And I've seen a lot of people say it. I mean, more for tricks. Gaethje threw a lot more playful leg kicks in training. Uh, the crazy part about it, Gaethje, when he's fighting Chandler, you saw the leg kicks in that one take great effect in that fight. Just being, you know, kind of burned in the mind, like I said. But when you look at this one, I saw a lot of people going to the fact in the comments about Gaethje and his wrestling. And wow, he's got it there. I mean, you think Trevor Whitman's going to put a game plan around it. And, and... It seemed like this week, even in the lead-up, Justin Gaethje doing interviews. I know he did one with uh, Shaquille Majuri, Canadian, friend of the show. And he said, I'm going to get back to the wrestling. I'm going to get into it. it. seems like he says it every now and again. When I see it, I'll believe it. That's kind of it. It's exactly. Like, that's my problem. I know the background is there. I know he's capable of doing it. But my issue is, if I haven't seen you do it in years, I'm going to start to believe that that sword isn't as sharp as it once was. It's like Draymond Green shooting three-pointers. He was good at it. But that was like eight years ago. And if I haven't seen it for eight years, I'm not just all of a sudden going to start believing that we're going to see it. So if anyone can do it, I'm glad you bring it up. Trevor Whitman's going to be the guy to kind of bring that skill set back out of you. I just wonder if it is a little bit too little too late. But this is going to be an incredible fight no matter what they end up doing. I will be interested to see how Fazeev does defensively with those light kicks, though. I think that'll be a big conversation in the fight. Yeah, it definitely will. And it wasn't that Moicano fight as well until he knocked him out. Matter second pick... There are a lot of people that are kind of all over the place with the fight of the night, but Christian Leroy Duncan taking on Dusko Todorovic. And in this one, again, there was more in the comments throughout the week. They talked about the fact that maybe this is a fight where Dusko goes back into the pocket of the wrestling because Todorovic is good with his wrestling, great with his forward pressure. He's a jiu-jitsu black belt as well. And he's one of those sneaky fighters that if he invites the brawl, sometimes he wins, sometimes he gets knocked out. Malone Hart with the giant super chat. I don't know if we're the best ones out there. Well, thank you very we're, much, though. We appreciate that you think we're the best. We're, we're one of the ones out there, but that's much appreciated. Malone Hart with the giant Super Chat out You're there. The MVP. In this fight, Matt, I mean, Super Chat and Chris and Leroy Duncan, I mean, he's got that belt around his waist from Cage Warriors, the middleweight champ over there. He won it. He defended it. Um, and, and now he's here. I love this fight because both of these guys, when it comes to their striking... They make their fights very fun in different ways. And it's a great matchup for Duncan to be introduced to UFC fans, I think. Because if you know, you realize how talented and how good of a fighter he is. But if you are just someone who watches kind of UFC pay-per-views or just UFC fight night cards, you're going to get introduced to one of the crazier strikers, one of the more explosive, more powerful strikers really on the planet in this division. And with Disco's style, you bring it up. Just very aggressive, be it with the wrestling or with his own striking. It should leave some of those holes open for Duncan to counter off the back foot. But on the flip side, we're going to learn how well Duncan can fight when he is under pressure because when you're fighting Dusko, you're going to be pressured for the majority of the fight. So I think this is a great fight for Duncan to just get introduced to a lot of UFC fans. Dusko, a very, very tricky fighter. Christian Leroy Duncan, again, an IMMAF stud. What's going to happen with that organization? We don't necessarily know moving forward, but what we do know, Matt, is again, we have 15 total fights on the card headlined by that trilogy title fight. And it really starts off, Matt, with a fight that is tricky to offer you up a preview and prediction. And it's odd that a, a channel based on that type of stuff would really go that way with it. But hear me out because we have Juliana Miller, 3-1, and one, Ultimate Fighter winner on the latest season, season 30. She competed last summer, beat Brogan Walker, who's out of her fight coming up next weekend. So that one is scratch. But for Miller, now she's making that real UFC debut against a real UFC fighter in the returning Veronica Macedo Hardy. It seems like her is going to be the play just like you know ash Mose is going to be with you they changed that spelling today but matt when it comes down to this one this is a clash of styles it really is i mean veronica hardy might be kind of remembered as that woman that was in there and submitted pollyanna viana very quickly that. however 
Yes, she has good jiu-jitsu, but her base is Taekwondo, and she moves around the outside like Eminem in the early 2000s, late 90s, and that's Veronica Hardy's specialty. So against somebody like Juliana Miller, I can see Veronica Hardy having a lot of success with that movement, in and out. She's really good at kind of not hanging around to get touched up yeah. all that much. Against bigger fighters, she could be. She was liable in that UFC debut against Ashley Evans-Smith. Her last time out was against Bia Malecki a few years ago, and that was a bigger, more you know kickboxing-based fighter in Bia Malecki. So for me... I do have a hard time trying to pick this one. Morphatrix saying, I think Veronica is going to surprise a lot of people here based on the line. I think I kind of echoed that at the start of the week yeah. in my analysis because Juliana Miller has progressively gotten better with her hands, but it's not really what's gotten her to the dance. It's her grappling that really makes her stand out. And even with the improvements that she's been able to make, you wonder if that has gotten her up to the level of someone like Hardy. I just wonder if Hardy's going to be able to have the space to strike for 50 minutes throughout this fight. Because if she does, then yes, she should be able to win a lot of those moments on the outside. But the problem is, on the inside, I do think she is going to struggle. I know that's a weird thing, because normally you assume the smaller fighter, at least the shorter fighter, is going to want to get on the inside. And of course, she will have to to have some success. But Miller is really good at just wrapping up the arms and trapping her opponent. Going for a lot of, not really single leg and double leg takedowns. They are more kind of trips and throws from the clinch position. And I think those are going to be open against a fighter like Hardy. For his good of a striker as Veronica is, she's not one of these one-hitter quitters like Roy Nelson from the outside, so I do think Miller is going to be able to walk forward quite a bit throughout this matchup, and not really be worried about eating the big shots. Now, yes, could she find herself behind on the significant strike numbers like 72 to 18 by the end of the second round? Maybe? Yes, I could see that being a world, but I just think Miller, at a certain point, is going to be able to get on top really be able to implement her grappling game. Yeah, I mean, when you do look at this one for Miller, you look at her last fight in Bro Brogan Walker, and take that one as the sample size and again she had a lot of the body lock trips she had the same thing throughout the show and her two wins there but you look at the strikes that are able to get through against some of these women it's a lot of left-handed or left-sided strikes and when you look at veronica she is a southpaw as well so that's going to open it up for her really flexible with her kicks going to the body going to the head is hardy 83 percent of the fans at fight night picks going with juliana miller to get the win you have a look at it and as was mentioned before miller is a juiced up favorite in the matchup minus 435 over on best fight odds so for me again i do have uh juliana miller in the matchup but i i do struggle with this pick because i think veronica hardy has a lot better of a shot and when i watched the tape i was on the fence about taking hardy and usually when it's an underdog that's that big i go with the underdog if you just want my honest opinion, I just don't think either fighter has the highest ceiling in the world. Like, I don't think Hardy's going to be a ranked fighter, and I, I struggle to think if Miller's not able to make some significant gains in her striking, that she will be able to make it to that level. I would love to be proven wrong, it's just, that's why this fight is really difficult to make a prediction on. I do have Miller, because at least the one thing she does very well, I think she will be able to get it to that area in the game, but if she is going to start moving up the ranks, it is going to be important for her to really start to improve on her striking, because it is a little stiff from the outside, it isn't very fast, so I think some of these upper echelon fighters will be able to take advantage of that. It's a tricky one to start off the card. It's a banger in the second fight on the card. You have oh, the yeah. first fighter out of England that's featured here in Jai, the Black Country banger, Herbert, representing Wolverhampton, and he's taking on Mr. Highlight, Ludwig Klein. And when Klein came into the UFC, came in on short notice, wasn't able to make the weight, so it was a catch weight of 150 pounds. Knocked out, smoking at Shane Young, and he hit him with that combination, the hook, the kick. Oh. You knew it. You loved it from the regional yes, scene. Yes. And if you remember the regional scene tape of a guy like Ludwig Klein, it was a mix of the martial arts. He was mixing his wrestling with his jiu-jitsu. He was utilizing that really good kickboxing, the in and the out. But then after that, he took on a couple of really tough, gritty fighters, and he suffered a couple of losses. So for Klein, he was on a nice win streak, lose those two fights, goes back over to Spartacus in his home country, and finds that success again. And his last time out, dropped Mason Jones near the end of that fight. And for Jones, that was a kind of a see you later out of the UFC. And Jones is one of those guys, you have to think, if he was still with the company, he'd be on this card. Like, exactly. Cage Warriors guy, former double champ. So... A really tricky fight in this one. I see uh, T Taylor Christian saying, best fight on the card. K. Demer Demercy saying, problem with Jai is he can't take a punch. I've seen him take punches. I've seen him wow. take kicks at the same time that have been really tricky. But for Jai Herbert, when he's mixing in, again, he's a guy out of orthodox, that lead leg, head kick, and then he's throwing those combinations. The one that he landed against Francisco Trinaldo, it was one, two, three, four, hook, 
uppercut, and he dropped him, and Trinaldo looked completely surprised. Jai Herbert does have great boxing combinations, but the problem is, the longer he stands in the pocket, it boosts his own effectiveness, which is great. But the problem is, and many people have brought it up in the comments, it does make him more susceptible to some of those big shots. Now, the range of this fight will be really important, because if Klein's able to stand on the outside and really blast his own kicks, I know we have talked about the kicks of Herbert, but I don't think he's going to be able to have a lot of success in that range. I do think his boxing is going to be at the forefront of his game. So for Herbert, I think he is going to have to get on the inside and make this a risky fight and kind of play the extremes because if he is able to land with a lot of consistent power shots, I got to be honest, there's not a lot of guys in the division who can stand up to them. And I don't know if that sounds like hyperbole, but like Jai Herbert got them hands on him. He's got insane hand speed, got really nice power too. And you brought it up, has nice looping shots from weird angles, almost throws some of those shovel hooks like a prime Robbie Lawler. So there are a lot of positives to like from a guy like Jai Herbert. I just think, and I brought it up, the longer he stands in the pocket to accentuate his own strengths it does make a more susceptible to the shot from a guy like Klein and I have liked what I've seen from Ludwig Klein in his UFC career I was pretty down on him after those losses but he has been able to show a version much more similar to the guy that we saw in the regional you, scene. you saw it in his fight against Nate Land where the power bar started to drain as it exactly. went on the wrestling looked like it took a lot out of him and Nate I mean you could probably hit that guy with a hammer in the shoulders and he'd still be throwing That bombs. man probably so. owns a Peloton. He's a wild, wild guy. And I see the comment there from Kyle Catterile saying, could be a snoozer. Guys, this was like, if I this is a good one. If Christian Leroy Duncan taking on Todorovic wasn't the second option for fight of the night, this would probably be it. The fans at Fight Night Picks on Instagram are split. You can find us like there it. every week on the poll. 56% going with Klein, 44%. Going with Jai Herbert. Herbert fighting close to home. And Klein is the slight favorite in the matchup. I have lead Vic Klein because I think he's just a little bit more well-rounded. Jai Herbert, a little susceptible to the takedown. But I mean, for Herbert in the UFC, you look at the names that he's faced. Hanato Maikano, who if I'm not mistaken, doesn't he have a main event that was just booked? Yeah, he's pretty good, guys. Yeah, it's coming up in not that long. He did get knocked out by Ilya Tapuria two fights ago. And in that one, I mean, he dropped Tapuria with a really tricky hand. Or yeah, he dropped him with a really tricky hand. Head, head kick. kick. He almost knocked him clean. Yeah, out. he hit him shid to the dome was what that one was. And then Tapodia came back and you want to see a walk-off knockout. It was like Garbrandt versus Sunso. So a crazy, crazy fight there. I don't necessarily agree with the no-chin stuff because for Herbert, he's faced a lot of really heavy, heavy punchers he in has, his fights. It is fair, though, to say when he gets hit by big shots, he doesn't recover all that well because that's the thing. He's not a guy who just goes down, but when he does go down, he's not getting up all that often afterwards. Like, there's just guys who don't seem to recover all that well after a big shot. For Herbert, like, he's, what, 34 years old? He's been in a lot of crazy fights. Like, it's not wild to say he's not as durable as he once was. That's and a guy that spent time at Team Renegade, you have quite a few fighters on this card. Leon Edwards is one of them. Jai Herbert is another. So if you can toss us a like, those people keep on a showing up. We'll move into Joanne Wood taking on Luana Carolina. First of three Scottish fighters. You have the Scazi later on in... And Casey O'Neill, she's going to be taking on Jennifer Maya. But in this matchup, Matt, Scotland's own Joanne Wood. And she's somebody that spent time training in Europe. Training at TriStar. She was an early TriStar fighter in her UFC career. She settled, of course, at Syndicate MMA. A gym that continues to bring in a great pool of talent. Even on next weekend's card, Matt. This is going to come as a surprise. It's an Easter egg for next weekend. Alex Perez is training out of Syndicate MMA. Interesting. Do you know what my problem is with Joanne Wood? And I was trying to think about it all week long, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. Do you know what's concerned me throughout this portion of her career? We talk more about her negatives and what her game plan has to be to avoid those negatives, I feel like, than what her positives are. Not saying those positives don't exist anymore, but a lot of her game now is just avoid the takedown at all costs. Don't get taken down for the love of God, because if you do, we all kind of know what's going to happen. Because for Wood... It used to be, remember how aggressive her striking was? Remember how great the Muay Thai was? How good the clinch elbows were? And how great her spinning techniques were? Like, this is going to be a throwback. But she knocked out Valerie Lareda with a spinning back fist. And the Torno. Letourneau, thank you. Yeah, in the first women's 125 fight of all time. They just let them go up to 125 before it was a division. Anyways, fun fact for you guys. But... Throughout Wood's career, it has become more of a conversation of, hey, instead of her going out there and really beating up her opponents with her Muay Thai, it's how does she just avoid getting taken down? And I know this isn't a matchup where you necessarily worry about that as much as some of her earlier ones, but that just struck me how it's never a great sign when that's the point of your career that you're at. Like, we talk about Cowboy Cerrone that way, Robbie Lawler to a certain degree in that capacity. It's, hey, we acknowledge that all of those positives are there. I just wonder that... If, 
Think about all the kind of great athletes ever, like great boxers. When there's that much tape out on you at a certain point, a lot of people are going to start to notice the weaknesses in your game. And I just wonder if Wood has got to that point in her career. There's a lot of things in this fight where it's kind of a little odd. And I see it over there in the comments. Eris, uh, Eric Estes saying, Dread have underrated ground game and underestimated Molly. I, I don't know if those two things go together because... In some fights, Molly McCann has really good wrestling. In some exactly. fights, Molly McCann has great boxing. In most fights, she does. But it's bringing those skills together. And sometimes for Molly, it just doesn't happen. But when it does, it looks like her fight against Alana Carolina. It was like last weekend. You are you you feel fine at this point to be wrong. But in the J.J. Aldrich fight against Ariane Lipsky, Lipsky looked like the best form that we Definitely. talked about she could be at. And who knows about J.J. Aldrich? Maybe it was a rough day. Maybe it was a rough weight cut. Maybe she peaked too early in training. Who knows? But Aldrich wasn't the best version that we've ever seen. Lipsky was her best version. So in that fight, Carolina versus McCann. McCann looked great and not necessarily did Luana Carolina. But you look at this matchup, and again, you talk about Joanne Wood. She, the last three fighters that she's faced, she's lost to. But all three of those women went on to a title oh, shot. Yeah off of a Joanne Wood win and Luana Carolina if she wins this fight she's not going to go on and fight for title because neither one of these women are ranked at fight night pick 61 percent of the fans going with Joanne Wood to get the the win in this fight and again Wood is fighting much further down in competition Definitely. and we saw this recently on certain cards like Cody Garbrandt fighting Trevin Jones this kind of feels like that great reset now we know that Joanne Wood's 37 Cody Garbrandt is not 37 he's early 30 so when you look at this matchup Matt for me, I think there's a great shot for Joanne Wood to land a lot of strikes from the outside. She can land a lot of volume on somebody like Luana Carolina. For me, I'm going to go with Luana Carolina because in the performances that she's had in the OC, she's either lost, except for a debut. She's either lost the first round or lost handily and had to come back in these. And I've seen her come back, but... Again, it is a, a, a tricky, tricky one out there. No, I like Caroline in the matchup. Again, I just worry about Wood and how much tape out there is on her. And I know that the level of competition has been very high, but they're all beating her pretty much the exact same way. And when your weakness does become that big of a weakness to where anybody, even if it's not their kind of X factor, can just go out there and uh, execute a game plan like that, I get concerned when a fighter enters that stage of their career. So, so I, I, Caroline. I see Clay saying, maybe like when Loma finished Reed, I was in a hotel in Montreal watching that fight, and I've never felt so happy for a fighter to get a win like that she gets the choke and finishes reach she screams she's so happy a great win for loma look for me what a fight matt jake hadley is taking on malcolm gordon and matt malcolm gordon canadian yeah, yeah. i mean just unprofessional 129.5 and it's not like he people got maple syrup right now craig He's probably into the sweets. Gabriel Santos took his fight on what? Like nine days notice he did. on this card? He made weight. Malcolm Gordon's known about this fight for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's not short notice. He missed the weight. Uh, Manny's saying it's a pop and popcorn fight. Eric is saying I want to choose Gordon on this one. This is one of those weird fights because at 125, you win two, three. And listen, it's a deep division now. It's it not is. 29. Exactly. There's, There's a, a lot, lot of 2020. Now. 125 is full right now. And they've done a really good job of acquiring talent. Just like like Bruno Silva beating Tyson M last weekend. Taeda. When you look at this one and Tatsuro Taeda as well, when you look at this fight, Matt, Malcolm Gordon, does he box well? Yeah, he boxes well. He gets Can he hit. hit? Can he hit? But can he wrestle? Yeah, he can wrestle. He can. And listen, against Makayev, he struggled a little bit. However, he had two really good chokes in on Muhammad Makayev his last time out. Against a guy like Jake Hadley, I'm going to take Hadley a little bit with his... Uh, with his grappling, with his top pressure and that he piece, has I think. on a guy like Gordon. However, I would not be surprised if Malcolm Gordon won this fight, even with the weight miss here. Uh, I agree with everything you said. I just think the pace of Hadley is going to be difficult for Gordon. I thought that at the start of the week. Now with Gordon missing weight, I, I doubt... Fighters never miss weight and then get better cardio. I, I don't think that's a hot take me saying that. So for Gordon, I do worry about just what level of him we are going to get. And I like Hadley at the start of the week. So for all those reasons, I understand why some people are a little bit concerned about Hadley and just what his overall sailing is. But I think this is a great fight to just get a better understanding of him moving forward. Because like you had mentioned, we know what Malcolm Gordon's good at. We know what he's not great at. And beating a guy like him is going to be a big teller moving forward. So I do have Hadley in the matchup. Yeah, it, it is a tricky one. And if you do look at it for Jake Hadley, the fans at Fight Night Picks, 86% have Hadley to get the win. If I'm not mistaken, he was a pretty big favorite at the start of the week, and he still is right now. He's almost a 4-1 to one favorite here. So you do look at this one, uh, you know, the weight miss for Malcolm Gordon. But outside of the UFC, it was that toughness, it was the durability, it was the fact that you saw 
Malcolm Gordon getting hit, taking a shot, rallying back in some of these He's fights. He's like a tiny Tony Gravely. Yeah, he kind of is like a Tony Gravely. And Tony Gravely last weekend, what a fight he was in. Exactly. And he they, doesn't know how not to get into a bar. They burner. didn't give him and Victor Henry fight of the night. That was wild. So in this matchup, I have Jake Hadley ever so slightly, Matt, but it should be a very... Very good one, and uh, yeah. I but mean, like you mentioned, it does feel like a lot of these prospects don't only have to win in this division. They gotta look good doing it too, because there's four, five, six guys who all seem to be knocking at the door of the top 15. So I feel like 125 is in a really good place right now. Uh, Timothy is saying Hadley by armbar in the fight. We'll see if he can get the armbar. Are you just saying that because Makaya was able to go out there and do that? Why would you say that? That's Hadley's a, an active grappler. Hadley, That's yeah. What I like about if, him. if you have a look at Jake Hadley, and I know I mentioned this at the start of the week, if I go back to that fight, because we won't show Christian Leroy Duncan just yet, you go through and you look at Jake Hadley as a pro. He's a former Cage Warriors champ, former EFC champ, rear naked choke, rear naked choke, rear naked choke, rear naked choke. He's only ever won by rear naked choke in his last time out triangle. So tough to say by Armbar, just where Makai was able to do it. But if you look at another former Cage Warriors champ, the next fight at middleweight, we have Christian Leroy Duncan take on Disco Todorovic. And again, I pumped myself up for this fight, Matt. I got buddies coming over. We're going to be watching this. Like, we're we're really, really into it. A guy who thought that the Great Lakes might have been the ocean. I can... But when you look at this fight, ocean. Matt, it's just a pool. <laughs> Disco Todorovic for this guy, I mean, you look at the fight that he had against yeah. Jordan Wright. I mean, they're going at it. Jordan Wright taking Disco Todorovic down. Never thought that I would see that I one. I still can't get over that. Dis- Flying to the west and we live next to the Atlantic. Disco was able to go out there, and he was able to just rally through that. Jordan Wright was huffing and puffing in the he second was. round. Todorovic is able to go out there and get the finish. Christian Leroy Duncan, all of that amateur schooling. As a pro, he's undefeated. He had a few losses when he was an amateur. But as a pro, going out there, knowing full well that you're probably going to, like, people are going to try and take you down, and that's what happens in a lot of his fights. You saw that in his title fight with Cage Warriors. But he's pretty good at grappling. I wouldn't say he's as good as Disco. Disco's a better grappler. But when you look at Christian, his striking, his efficiency, but his creativity, I mean, he reminds me of a toned down, more well-versed Raymond Daniels. Uh, I'm going to go back. People are going to appreciate this basketball reference. This will be a bit of an obscure one. He's Jonathan Kuminga to me. Like, Jonathan Kuminga is this prospect who plays for the Warriors, who his athleticism is like 150 out of 10. He's insanely athletic. But he's trying to, like, put together some of the skills. And this year, he's been able to put together a lot of those skills. Duncan reminds me a little bit of a guy like that. You can tell how athletic he is. And it does speak to some of his grappling, because you're right. Are the X's and O's of his grappling at, like, a Chael Sonnen level? No, not at all. But he is able to use that athleticism, the speed, the explosiveness, to get back up to his feet. And he is one of these guys who will get taken down, kind of... Kind of just on his butt with his legs straight out, but he can scoot back up to his feet very quickly. He kind of has that Alexander Volkanovsky takedown defense, I guess is the best, or is a good way of describing it, but of course, he doesn't have the technique of a guy like Volkanovsky. I just really like what I've seen out of him with his explosive striking, and in this matchup, it is interesting. I brought it up at the start of the video. This is a great introduction to UFC fans, because if he loses this fight, it's probably going to be in spectacular fashion, and Disco is going to gain a ton of stock, and on the flip side, if he wins this fight, it might be behind, like, flying knee it could be uppercut like wild finish and then of course he's going to gain a lot of stock so i just think this is one of those rare perfect ufc introductory matchups yeah and i do see it from morph tricks saying that disco likes to do the anderson silva matrix dodging but he's not nearly as fast as a prime anderson so when you do look at it like i i think disco's got a good shot at winning this fight just because he can he can weather a lot of the storms he can wrestle he's good with his jiu-jitsu he's training at home so there's a lot of positives for a guy like disco with Christian Leroy Duncan, again, the creativity out of the striking, the different angle changes, the fact that he throws the spinning back fist and the spinning back elbows, but he's not somebody like... Uh Marab does it, but he spins on air a lot of the time. Does, yeah. Christian tends to land when he throws them. And if you go and look at his fight against Jadi Milan, when he's challenging for the belt, first round gets taken down, he gets beaten. Second round, Jadi's starting to slow down a little bit. Christian's starting to heat up. And then he throws an axe kick just in the air. That one misses, big action, but it's in the third round. And then after that, throws a flying knee, gets a knockout. It's insane. His last time out there, the flying knees, the spinning attacks, there's a lot of things that I do like. And again, out of Duncan in the fight where he's a minus 1,400 favorite against against Justin Moore. He was able to go out there and submit him very quickly. And I'm happy that Jesse Taylor fight didn't happen for Jesse Taylor. I'm just being completely honest there. Jesse's been hot. But when he's you have... 
50. Yeah, have a look at this one, Matt. At Fight Night Picks, Matt Dodge was the agent for him. 75% going with Duncan to get the win. Uh, and Christian Leroy Duncan in the matchup. Uh, they move these guys He should around. get a big pop at home, too. I would think he's probably going to get a big pop. So he is favored in the matchup. So, Matt, we both have Christian Leroy Duncan in this one. We move on to the next fight. And this is one that we were split on at the start of the week. And I'd really like to get people's thoughts over there in the comment section. The, the discourse seems to be flowing over there. The likes are starting to trail in. But we have a look at this fight, Matt. Lerone Murphy taking on Gabriel Santos. Santos taking this fight on the short notice. And he's going to be replacing Nathaniel Wood. So, Wood? Murphy? And Anyone? That one. would have been a fun fight at Featherweight. Wood looked great in his last time out. Gabriel Santos. You talk about guys that we've seen kind of withstand a storm. Gabriel Santos, second to last fight. I mean, he almost got knocked out. He got knocked down. Then he got hit by an illegal knee. Referee didn't do anything about it. At the Between round one and round two, Osiris Maya, he was over there. He was having a He'll look. allow a little bit of shenanigans every now and then. But when you look at this fight, Matt, I mean, Gabriel Santos, for me, when I did the analysis and we talked about it at the start of the week, let the cat out of the bag. I picked him, but it was because I like his output. I like his stance switches. Good he goes bombers. body head quite a bit. So for me... He does a little bit more in his fights than Lerone Murphy does. And that's a really just oversimplification of what I have to say. But for Lerone Murphy, you talk about a guy that picks his power shots. He does. Lerone Murphy is that guy. So I do like Santos, even on the short notice. I like that he made the weight, A, because Malcolm Gordon didn't. But I like Gabriel Santos in the matchup for that. And he was a pretty big underdog when we when we came into this one. I think the jab of Murphy is going to be very important in this matchup. Because you bring it up. Santos has great flow to his striking. When he does get into a rhythm, he's really hard to break out of it. But how do you break guys out of a rhythm with their striking? A really good jab from that long range is going to be able to do that. Especially in MMA. And the threat of the takedown. What does Lerone Murphy have? He does have a very good jab on the outside, and you're right. I do worry about some of the output and what he has, or I guess what he doesn't have after some of the initial jabs and kicks from the outside. But the thing about Murphy is, if you just want to talk about the foundation of a game and something that you can build upon going forward, Lerone Murphy has everything you want when you're looking for a high-level mixed martial artist. He's got good cardio, he's got a good chin, he does get hit a little bit, but at least we know that when he does get hit, he can take some of those big shots. He has good power, Just he does check a lot of those boxes. This is, this is a weird fight, though, because it's going to be a close fight, and that's a wild thing to say about Santos coming in on short notice, fighting a guy who at one point had quite a bit of hype behind him. I know it has fizzled out a little bit as of late, but that's more due to inactivity than due to poor performances. So for me, I still have Murphy, but I can admit that Santos is a great opportunity in this fight, which again, like I said, is a wild thing to say that a short notice prospect's going to come in and have a good chance against Murphy, but Gabriel Santos is that type of and prospect. Or even if he loses this, I don't think he's going to go 0-3 in the UFC by any means. No, and I had a lot to say about Santos. Santos kind of coming into this matchup and there was one thing that I completely forgot to touch on at the start of the week and then as soon as I did I went oh shoot that would have been a good one who does Gabriel Santos train with getting ready for a matchup like this now we know how good his striking is his grappling's pretty darn good as well and I know he struggled in what was it the second round against Elvis Brenner with the takedown and he was trying to work a little bit of his jiu-jitsu game he trains at Otto's BJJ but not the one in the states the one in Brazil his native Brazil and who does he train with there? Davi Hamosh and Howney Barcelos and Barcelos' dad, Learte, who's a pretty damn good grappler and wrestler as well. So I like that for Gabriel Santos, even on short notice to get you ready for a guy like Lerone Murphy. Would you say Gabriel Santos has nothing to lose when no one knows your name? When no one knows your name, I would say so. I think he's got nothing to lose. I'm sure at Fight Night Picks, I haven't had a look uh, at the votes on this one. 82% going Lerone That's Murphy. Over there in the comments section, Rob Lawrence saying, wasn't Murphy in a car accident a year ago? I don't know about that. But I do know when you do uh, focus on it for Murphy, he had some visa issues for the fight against Charles Jordan. He had some injuries that he had to clean up. He crash trained in Thailand as well as in the UK getting ready for this one. So we are split on the pick. But I think this is going to be a really fun oh, fight. Oh, yeah, I'm excited for this one. I got Santos. You have Murphy. So, Matt, we look at our next fight. And a lot of people didn't like uh, Mohamed Makayev's comments this week. Is his shoulder injured? I don't know. But when you look at it for Makayev, he does have the wrestling in spades. I wouldn't even yeah. say... Like, sometimes they say, oh, the guy's got wrestling in his back pocket. Or he's got a good left hook to the body in his back pocket. Love when he uses it. Mohamed Makayev. He's got spinning striking. It's very creative. He, he reminds me a lot of Umar Nurmagomedov at 135 pounds. But Umar is leveled up in that respect. When you look at a guy like Makayev, it's a lot of chaining the wrestling together. It's good cardio. His hands drop as the fight goes on. And 
somebody mentioned it earlier. I'm sorry that I don't remember your name, but you had talked about the fact that, oh, it's Morphatrix. That's who it was. Uh, Disco likes to do the Anderson Silva Matrix thing. Muhammad Makayev likes to do it, he does. only Makayev gets hit when he does it. So scares me a little bit. And Jafal Filio, not necessarily a high output guy. He picks his power shots. He's a Nova Uniao trained guy out of Brazil. His jiu-jitsu, you can see it from the picture right there. Black belt in exactly. BJJ. He's more Leonardo Santos out of Nova Uniao than like Jose Aldo. But for me, Filio as a big underdog, which most people are going to be against a guy like Makayev, I know Makayev should probably be fighting ranked competition, but Jafel Filio is close to that level, fighting outside of the rankings and making his UFC debut. I have Makayev in this matchup. I just, like, Makayev is weird. He's like, when you make a My Career player in 2K and you've messed the build up completely, but you just stick with it long enough to where you're, like, kind of good with that character because nothing Makayev does makes a lot of sense. Like, there's not a lot of people who are starting MMA classes and their coaches go, hey, Go watch this Makayev guy and copy everything he does. Now, yes, the one thing he does well, which is the wrestling and the grappling, he does extremely well. And there's not a lot of guys at the UFC level who are going to be able to hang with him for extended periods of time on the mat. Yes, you're going to be able to catch him in a submission here or there, make things uncomfortable for him. But in the long run, he's going to be able to get out of those, get on top, and really be able to threaten with his own submissions. I think we're probably just going to be able to see more of that in this matchup. I would like to see him fight ranked competition like you had mentioned because in the flyweight division, it is much better than it used to be, but there is a bit of a drop-off between some of the ranked fighters and some of the unranked fighters because it is a lot of prospects kind of making their way up. And I do feel like Makayev, when you're still a minus 6-700 in a lot of these matchups, you are justified to start taking on some of these tougher fights. Yeah, and when you look at it for a guy like Jafel Filio, he was fighting a guy before he fought at Chavaria over on Contender Series that wasn't all that great it was a tune-up fight against davison silva over with shuto he had he competed in 2019 beat venetia salvador who fights next and he is weekend. a good grappler exactly yeah he is a good grappler then he fought silva as a tune-up then he fought roybert echevarria who hadn't fought a high level competition but for me when i look at this one when you consider a guy like jafel filio when you look at a guy like makayev it should be a stepping stone fight for makayev it's a very very dangerous fight for makayev considering how even in just little flickers, a guy like Malcolm Gordon was able to have success. Would you agree with me, though? Filio does lack kind of the physicality of a Malcolm Gordon, and that's where I think he is going to struggle, because Gordon it might not be the jiu-jitsu grappler that Filio is, but he's a strong guy who's going to be able to move you around a little bit on the mat. I just think Makai is going to have such a big strength advantage in this matchup. Yeah. That's why I think Filio is going to struggle. AG saying it's Filio or pass, actually, so just pass. I'll pick Muhammad Makai, but you talk about juiced up odds and not having a ton of confidence on a pick. This is one of those ones where if you fell asleep, you woke up tomorrow and, oh, Jafel Filio submitted Muhammad Makaya. I'd be pretty surprised. I wouldn't be that surprised whatsoever. So, Matt, we move into the next fight. And I, I kept the graphic the same way. However, I said it at the start of the week. His name is spelled with a U in his last name. Look out for that. PFL spelled it that way. But the UFC topology sure dog had it Ashmose. It's Yanal Ashmose. There should be a U there. And for Yanal Ashmose, undefeated. Out of Israel. Pretty hot right now. Tends to rally back in a lot of his fights. Uh, struggles with the wrestling in the first round, but somehow with a small, juiced physique. Like, he is just, like, you talk about, I mean, you can see it there. He, he's, he is very, you know, well-muscled. up. But he's able to carry it late into some of these fights. It's just really weird when you look at a guy like Yenal Ashmoz. AG saying people sleeping on Ashmoz. Yeah, I'll sleep on him. I mean... I like the tape that I went through. We showed that neck crank with the AC on and the windows open. Where he picked a guy up to submit him. I I don't know if I've ever seen somebody land. Raquel like Pennington that. did that to Misha Tate. Okay, but uh, you know Ashmo is able to go out there and do some fun things. He throws giant looping punches in a lot of his fights. Sam Patterson can shell up and wait for the fight sometimes, which does scare you. I've seen Patterson taken down early in fights. I've seen Patterson rally back from getting hit and hurt in some of his fights. I think Sam Patterson has a more complete game plan in a fight like this. I think he can utilize the length in a fight like this. Oh, yeah. And I think he can go out there and get the win. But, uh, you know, Lashmoz, I, I just, I don't know. I, I think Sam Patterson has a, a top 25 future for him, even though it's a really stacked division. I mean... I don't know where I put Yenal Ashmoos in a box in this division. Top 25, you could just say, oh, well, to me, he's a top 25. 
That's fine. Uh, uh, Patterson has a high ceiling, but there is a weakness he's going to have to clean up, and you brought it up. He doesn't have an active defense to where no. he has his hands up like and he moves. He only has his hands up, and he just kind of relies on the fact that his opponent's going to hit his hands on some of his strikes, and some of the other strikes are going to get through. And he doesn't have the fastest feet defensively. There is a lot of just backing straight up kind of into the cage, but the positives are there for a guy like Patterson. He has an incredible jiu-jitsu game when he is able to get guys onto the mat, and he's not someone who's kind of that boring style of crap is just going to wait in the full guard, wait in the half guard. He's looking for submissions the whole time he is on the ground, but the striking defense does really concern me in a division like this. So moving forward, I will be curious to see where Patterson does fall, but the positives are definitely there, and that's why I do like him in this matchup. Patterson getting that win, I mean, rallying back after the first round against Venetia Sensi, who had taken a really long time off in this matchup. Yanal Ashmoos was signed back in December. He's had a little bit of a layoff since about this time last year when he fought in the PFL Challenger Series, which is going on. Impa Kasang and I, big winner over there. In the matchup here, Matt, we'll have a look at Fight Night Picks for the total votes in our poll. We have a look, 78% going with Sam Patterson, 22% going with Ashmo's. AG's just throwing out the facts. You don't know how to use the length. Not really. In some of these fights, Sam Patterson will kind of rock him, sock him, uh, Venus flytrap. It's Brian Ortega without the elbows. Yeah, it really is tricky that way. So for me, I do like Sam Patterson in the matchup. I wasn't necessarily impressed by the Yanal Ashmoos tape that I did go back and watch. You guys can do it really quick. It's out there on Fight Pass and on YouTube. It's pretty easy to find his fights. I'll say this, though. I thought Chaos Williams wasn't going to be good in the UFC, and then he just knocked everybody out for the first two years. So Yanal Ashmoos could be that guy. So, Matt, we'll move on to the next matchup. We have Chris Duncan taking on Omar Morales. I like the fight. It's a couple of strikers. Story of two different ones, though. It's a couple of strikers, but they do it in different ways. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised that this is so high up on the prelims, whereas, like, Christian Leroy Duncan and Disco Todorovic isn't, Makayev isn't. But when you look at this matchup, Matt, Chris Duncan car crash strikes, and Omar Morales is all finesse with his kickboxing technique. So I love the fight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We talked about the fact that for Morales on this recent run, his last, what, three, four, five fights, he's trained out of... Hard Knock Sanford, Killcliffe FC. And now in this one, he's training out of the KO zone down in Miami. And I like that. I think that's a good good switch up. You get to train with some different fighters. But I envy the weather he's having. For Chris Duncan, also trains in the weather. Training out of, uh, what is it? Out of Deerfield Beach area. Training out of ATT. So a fun fight in this one. A couple of different strikers. And we were different on the pick in this one. Giancarlo we're, Schmidt and- saying Duncan by KO. And Piss Perfect Parlay saying this Duncan is the real deal. I mean, I watched him get knocked out by Slava Borshev and almost knocked out by Charlie Campbell. He got dropped, what did I say, three times? Slava Borshev can bang, though. Let's be fair. Duncan's a weird fighter, though. I haven't been this matchup, but I only think he's going to overwhelm Morales with his volume, with his pressure in the first round, and potentially get a finish in that kind of round, round and a half opening of the fight, because I think Omar Morales can go out there and win a 30-27 quite easily. 29-28 is probably a little bit more likely, because I do think Duncan is going to burn very hot in round one, and again, that's where a lot of this prediction comes down to. I just don't think Omar Morales has enough power to keep Duncan off of him. If Duncan does decide, hey, I'm going to make this fight really ugly, just get into the pocket and plant my feet here, because... If it is one of those fights, then I heavily favor Duncan because I know he's going to eat some shots, but Morales isn't really the type of guy who's going to go, okay, now I'll drop my hands and start throwing uppercuts from my hip. I know it's weird to say, hey, that might be the best way for him to win this fight, but the openings are there when you're fighting a guy like Duncan to land crisp counter shots. I just don't know if Morales can be able to move his feet for that long in the fight. So I do have Duncan, but this is one of those fights where either I look good and I look smart, or you're going to look way smarter than me because I don't think it's going to be a close fight by the time it's over. No, and I mean, if you look like Duncan, 69% at Fight Night Picks have Duncan to get the win in the poll. But for me, I, I like Omar Morales because it's a bit of a different look. He can oh, yeah. he can switch. He can fight from southpaw. For me, Morales, he's a low output guy, but he mixes his kicks into it. Whereas Duncan, you're going to see a little bit more the of kicks the will boxing. Be important. That's true. Marcus Mustard saying Slava has a fight that just got booked. I saw that over from a Big Marcel. Whether it's on his Instagram or his Twitter, make sure you follow him. Friend of the show. For me, I I do like Omar Morales in the matchup. Duncan is favored in his UFC debut. uh, No, actually, they're they're at par pretty well. Omar Morales, yeah, they're at par. So, listen, I mean, there's there's no wrong answer here until the end of the night. We will see how it plays out. Obviously, Morales has struggled of late. He had that kind of wild fight against Giga Chikadze. Got dropped late in that one. So it should be a fun one. We're split on the pick, and we move forward to the featured prelim. 
Jack Short. I like this fight. Getting the recognition, Wales own, representing the UK in London. And he's taking on Mr. Finland, Makwan Amirkani. If you're a good wrestler, but not a good grappler, Makwan's going to submit you. Exactly. If you're a good grappler and not necessarily a good wrestler, and you can get through the first storm of Makwan and his takedowns, sometimes you can rally back and beat him. For me, I look at this matchup, Matt, and for Jack Shore, people were bullish on my guy, Ricky Simone, and I necessarily wasn't. However, the parts where Jack Shore struggled against Ricky Simone in, the striking, some of the wrestling with the power, I don't necessarily see that happening against Makwan Amir Khani. So for me, I have Jack Shore in the matchup. Uh, you know, Makwan definitely needs this win, though. And we he saw does. him get it. Listen, we saw the last time Makwan fought in England. It was against Mike Grundy. It was. And it was a big, strong Grundy sport. I'm sure I picked Mike Grundy in that fight. And the fans were into it. His father was in poor health. It, like, it was a huge storyline. He runs out there for the takedown. And Mach 1 submits him really quickly. I think Jack Shore is quite a bit better than Grundy. I so think that's I. fair to say. Uh, don't take the Gaethje versus Bazee fight. Well, you gotta, you gotta talk about it. You can't think about it. Malone Hart hits up the Super Chat and said, Would y'all take the gaethje Fazee fight to be the fight of the night? Or any other fight being fight of the night. It seems like Gaethje's always a lock to be fight of the night bonus. I think it's going to be fight of the night. It's funny you say that. Because I was about to say, we've talked enough off camera. Like, that fight could be over the first combination either guy lands. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. But, like, how confident are you guys in Gaethje's chin still? Because I'm starting to have some serious concerns about him eating power shots from a guy like Fazeev. And I know Oliveira has huge power. Eddie Alvarez has huge power. So does Poirier. But those shots are starting to accumulate, starting to chip away, a la Dwayne Casey. You just gotta hit the rock. So, pay on the rock. Pay on the rock. So I I'm really concerned that that fight could be over pretty quick. But on the other hand, if it does make it past those first 60 seconds, it should be fight of the night. I just think Jack Short... Sure. Short with a lot of his takedown attempts, though, he's the type of guy that's going to go for the double, lock his hands, dump you over by the cage, rinse and repeat, and he leaves his neck out there. And we've seen him caught in some really tricky guillotine spots against former opponents where he either didn't get finished, he got into a dominant position on top, and he was able to kind of ground it out with his ground and pound. You saw what Short was able to do against a primary wrestler, poor boxer, and Ludwig Cholignan. But for me, I, I, I like Short with the complete package in the fight. So do I. For Amir Khani, any success he can have in this fight, I just don't know if it's sustainable past the first round. That's the honest truth. Amir Khani is good at grappling. He's a great wrestler. He has good jiu-jitsu. But the problem is, he gets so tired from doing the thing that he's really good at. And he will start to reach for takedowns as the fight goes on. You see that a lot in the Shane Burgos fight. You see that a lot in the Edson fight, too. The thing about Amir Khani is, to his credit, he has fought a very high level of competition. And it's going to remain the same after this fight against Jack Shore. But for sure... We're just going to learn a lot more about how he's going to look at this weight class, I think. And that'll be the really interesting thing moving forward. Lucky Day saying, Maquan is a father now. I have to lean towards the father. He's not cocky. Mr. Finland, we once knew. Uh, Lucky Day will shout you out if Maquan Amir Khani gets the win. He could Fred Van Fleet the NBA Finals. Just have a kid and turn into like Steph Curry. Marvin Vittori taking on Roman Delidze. First fight on the main card. People are rallying around this one. They're really excited about it. I mean, Marvin Vittori switching camps, learning the secrets, reading through Roman Delidze's journal, which I'm sure is a different little black wow. book. There's probably a lot in there. But the, the storyline for me at the start of the week was Delidze, I mean, he used to train in Ukraine with one of the top boxers there. And then he made his way to Extreme Couture. This is when he, like, around the time he made his UFC debut. Trained at Couture for a really long time. And then for this fight, he's training out of Tiger Muay Thai. Christian Leroy Duncan is there that's also on this card. There's a lot of fighters Fazeev. on this card that are Tiger Muay Thai. Mohamed Makayev's another one. Fazeev as well. But for Marvin Vittori, training out of Extreme Couture... I mean, I don't know what type of moves that Marvin Vittori is able to add to his fighting and dating life repertoire. So we'll see how that one plays oh, out. Oh, he pulls. May I offer you an espresso, madam? But for Marvin Vittori, uh, a great repertoire. That's what I hate. Marvin Vittori, don't talk poorly about everybody's coffee. I get it yours might be better, but you're not gaining any fans in every embedded when you're like... That's terrible. Do you think he roasts his own beans? Oh, without a doubt he roasts his own beans. This is an interesting fight because I talk about Marvin Vittori every single week, guys. You know why? It's because he was a guy who had good striking, great boxing, or sorry, great wrestling and cardio. Just didn't really have the bridge to put those two things together. But he really has been able to improve ducking his head blocking his head and being sound defensively before he does get that takedown. And that's going to be an important thing in this matchup because if Roman Delidze has like a superstar X factor to put it into Madden terms in anything, it's hurting his opponents at the weirdest darn times in his fights and having really good close range power because you look at a guy who's built like Roman Delidze, 
And he is okay at long range, but that is kind of the weakness of his game. He's not going to throw a lot of volume from the outside, really jab you to death. He's going to throw a lot of those big looping strikes, really use his yeah, power and yeah. athleticism. Roman Delidze, he's he is like El Gary. When Roman Delidze is on the outside, he either lands the big power shot that gets the U and A out of the crowd, or he swings on a curveball that's in the dirt. It's tough. Like Paul Goldschmidt, who's really weird because yeah, he's, he's awesome. MVP. I know, but then he'll take the worst swings you've ever seen sometimes. It doesn't matter. Anyways, it is a weird fight because I think Roman could go out there and get the finish, even though Marvin Matori has been one of the more durable fighters really in the UFC throughout his run at, I guess, 185 and then the brief tenure at 205 and then back down. But I do have Vittori because until I do start to see that chin be kind of chipped away at, I don't know if Delizze is going to be have enough, going to have enough power sorry, to hurt Vittori. And if he does... I'm going to be the most surprised person on planet Earth because Martin Vittori has eaten some of the bigger shots we've seen from some huge power punchers like Paolo Costa landed clean on him, Robert Whittaker landed clean on him, Adesanya was able to as well, and he wasn't dropped or knocked down from any of those big uh, big punchers, so I do have Vittori in the matchup. And I'm sure from Vittori, you want to pick out a really good fight that could play into this one. I'm Wayne Kerr. Marvin went from incredibly annoying to endearing so quickly. That's what happens when you fight Costa. Let's get into it. For Marvin Vittori, I think the fight that you can look at to have success, you can look at the Paulo Costa fight, a lot of adversity in that one, five-round fight, this one obviously three rounds, but for me, it's a Jack Romanson fight, punch for punch. The thing that doesn't translate as well is Vittori started to pull away round four, round five, but when you look at a matchup like this for Roman Delidze, the Hermanson fight, the fight against the Lid or uh, Dacus, the fights that he's had where he's gotten these crazy finish wins, the fight that he had against a smaller man in Loriano Staropoli where he's able to just ground him out, the fight that he had against John Allen, who was a good striker, ground him out, but I know it's a split decision. It was a little chintzy in that one. I do still like Roman Delidze in the fight, so I'm not going to change the pick just to be kind of fun with it. 61% at fight night picks going with Marvin Vittori to get the win. And Vittori, we haven't seen him lose to... And I don't say this as a negative thing, but we haven't seen him lose to a guy like Roman Delidze exactly. outside of that upper echelon of USC fighters. Adesanya, Adesanya, Whitaker. Is, are those the only losses of late? He's been at the top for a while, too. Really, after he beat Jack Hermanson, Hermanson kind of has become that guy. It's, hey, you beat Jack Hermanson, or it uh, used to be Derek Brunson, and the great things are going to happen to you. Ago. Uh, so yeah, for Vittori, it really has just been slow, steady improvements throughout his career, but I really like the version of him that we've seen as of late. I know he didn't look great against Robert Whittaker, but Whittaker is basically the exact stylistic kryptonite for Marvin Vittori, so for that reason, I have Vittori. All right, Matt, so if you do have a look at the next fight, we have Jennifer Maya taking on Casey Kenny, or sorry, Casey O'Neill. Casey Kenny, where, are you, where at, are you? Man, I like a Casey Kenny fight, and I like a Casey O'Neill fight as well. Didn't pick her at the start of the week, though. Went with a fair amount of underdogs, but for me, I like Jennifer Maya with the boxing on the outside, and people are going to go, Craig, but Casey O'Neill set a UFC flyweight record for significant strikes landed in a fight her last time out against Roxanne Modafferi, and to you, I say, yes, she did. Yes, she did. And I don't know if that's necessarily going to get her to the win in this Fun matchup. Teron Wynn had the UFC record for a while for most significant strikes I'm landed no in a three-round fight. So, yeah, you can't just look at stats. So, when you do look at this matchup, Matt, for Casey O'Neill, I would think, obviously, she had the knee injury right after the fight that she had against Roxanne Modafferi in training. She's been away for, what, just over a year since that Modafferi fight in Texas. But for Casey O'Neill, I wouldn't be surprised if the game plan was that of Couture, hey, look at Tatiana Suarez against Montana De La Rosa. Look at the quality of training partner, Taylor Guardado, another one. Uh, Couture, go out there, grapple Jennifer Maya, take her down, and, and implement yeah. the game plan. Like Casey O'Neill's fight against Antonina Shevchenko is what I think of. That's what I think is going to happen in this matchup. Not that Maya's a bad grappler by any means, but she's not like Brian Ortega or Fabrizio Verdum off her back. You can hold her down if you are a plus grappler. And I think Casey O'Neill, if she's been able to prove anything up until now, she's definitely a plus grappler. So I, I will be curious to see how much success Maya does have on the feet because I think her kicks are going to be really important. She does have a good leg kick. She has the more technical out of these two, I would say. But I do think the threat of the wrestling is going to be able to open up some of the striking for O'Neill on the feet. And then, of course, if O'Neill is able to get it onto the ground, I don't think she's going to make it the most aesthetically pleasing fight. I don't think it's going to really allow her to go for a lot of those big uh, submissions or really risk letting Maya back up to her feet or get that separation so Maya can go for a submission. But I still like O'Neill for all those reasons. And I just think the wrestling is going to be dominant enough to hold that top position and win rounds that way. Mr. Moneyline DMV, all sleeping on King, K uh, yeah, King Casey just like y'all slept on Blanchfield. If people 
like with the whole y'all sleeping on, I'd rather eat a full spoon of cacao than listen to people going, y'all sleeping on that fighter because you you do a 10 minute video and then you don't pick the fighter. 74% of the fans at Fight Night Picks going with Casey O'Neill. I have uh, Jennifer Maya in the matchup. You have O'Neill. And then we move into a fight that I've seen a lot of Brian Barberina this way. Not a lot of Gunnar Nelson, but I've seen a lot of Brian Barberina. Gunnar Nelson's a mysterious figure on Fight Week. Ah, uh, yeah, the Mjolnir Man. Does does he is? Do you think he's a little bit like Mickey Rourke in the second Iron Man movie, just creeping in the shadows? And he then could be. Here comes Gunnar Nelson. You ever seen that like Business Insider video? And there's that guy from Greenland who's like, "We eat the fermented shark." No. <laughs> it's very funny. Business Insider has so many videos. I know, but it's one of those ones where they like go meet the person from Iceland and this guy's just like, we ferment the Greenland shark. It's very good. It's wild though. That's the only thing I know. But <laughs> Iceland, this is a weird fight because what version of Gunnar Nelson is going to show up? And I've heard Brian Barberina call Gunnar Nelson a legend, which is kind of weird to think of. Yeah. Gunnar Nelson at one point was kind of building a resume to think, hey, he might not become champion, but he could be what, a top 10 fighter for kind of years. You know what I mean? Just be one of those guys who's a main stay in the division for a very long time do you, unfortunately do you think that Gunnar Nelson's a little bit like an old penny and if you rub the 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 crud off the penny enough you get Conor McGregor is that why Brian Barbarian called him a legend so. I think Gunnar Nelson's that old guy who sits alone at a coffee shop who doesn't talk to anybody but one day you start talking to him and he just tells you like good luck bud before work and it just makes your day that's what I think Gunnar Nelson is a Pandora's box this is my weird thing about this fight if Gunnar Nelson's that weird not aggressive version where he just stands on the back foot waits for the counter shot Brian Barberina could very well overwhelm him with a lot of his combinations and just with his output because there's uh, there's gonna be a fine scale in this fight where Gunnar Nelson has to absorb a certain level of punishment before he's gonna be able to land his own counter shots and Brian Barberina is gonna have to be able to eat those big counter shots after he's able to land his counters I do think there is a world where this could kind of become one of those fight of the night style fights even though you might not look at a Gunnar Nelson fight and immediately think crazy chaos but Brian Barberina is pretty good at taking that out of anybody so I have Gunnar Nelson because I think if it hits the mat he is the more technical grappler he does have that threat of the submission and I think on the feet Barbara is going to throw a lot more in terms of volume so we could start winning rounds but Gunnar Nelson is very powerful off that back foot and he might not throw a ton of volume but when he does decide to plant his feet and really throw he makes those shots count the thing that I don't understand about this fight Matt is uh, uh Brian Barbarina looks soft Brian Barbarina this over in the comments whatever Brian Barbarina looks the same pretty well every single fight, oh, yeah. physically. Uh, he always shows up, he's making the weight, he goes in there and puts on burn burners of a fight. And if it's a stand-up fight, it's going to be a great fight. And if it's not, well, think of his fight against Jason Wade. He gets taken down, what, ten times in that fight? It's, it's, a, it's a close one. He ends up, what was it, majority decision win. And it was a fight of the night, and it was really, really odd. But for Barbarina... You might say, oh, he's in it for... Like, people are saying he's in it for a paycheck. Guys, he moved his family permanently to North Carolina so he could train at Jim O to get ready for fights like this. So you couldn't be farther from the truth on that one. And for Gunnar Nelson, yeah... Is it going to be that odd karate style that he has on the outside looking to counter-strike at incredibly low volume against a high-volume kickboxer in Brian Barbarina? If it's a night like that with no takedowns, Barbarina wins Oh, the Barbarina fight. hurts Gunnar Nelson. This fight's over. Like, we saw in the Robbie Lawler fight. I know not Lawler's not what he used to be, but still, he's pretty durable. Barbarina hit him with one shot that kind of rocked him and never let him off the hook. He threw a minute and a half combination. I don't even remember how many shots he threw. It just took 90 seconds for him to stop throwing. So there is a world out there where Barbarina is able to get the finish. I, I just don't think this is that world. I, I like Nelson with the ground game. That's why I have him in the matchup. But this, again, this is another one of those tricky ones. 74% at Fight Night Picks. I put going with Gunny. And 26% going with Bam Bam. Have fun with the nicknames. Now we get into the great fight on Papier, Matt. We have Justin Gaethje taking on Raphael Fazeev. And Matt, for Raphael Fazeev, wearing a policeman's uniform on the UFC uh, embedded, I don't think that's allowed. I don't. That's not good. But when you look at it for Fazeev, Matt, I mean, a little bit of bad blood here. Craig was watching the movie The Town, looking at John Hamm, being like, no, 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 you're not a police officer. I mean, Rear Admiral was in that movie. But when you look at this fight... For Fazeev, I mean, he's riding that wave of success, the wave of performance bonuses, fight of the nights, and so on and so forth. When you look at it for Justin Gaethje, same thing can be said. These guys are a fun fight waiting to happen. Fazeev on the outside. I mean, he can come in with that high stance. Oh, he yeah. can come in throwing those leg kicks, mixing it into the body, then to the head, spinning wheel kick, Brad Riddell. See you later, bud. But when you look at it for a guy like Gaethje... His leg kicks can limit the movement of a guy like Fazeev. He might be the best leg kicker we've ever seen. I'm not joking when I say that. His left hook, deadly. And when you look at Gaethje, 
the thought in the mind, he just plants that seed like everybody in our zone of the world when they start getting ready for their gardening for the spring. They're going to be planting seeds next week. Justin Gaethje plants the seed of wrestling for a lot of his opponents. Makes you worry a little bit. Now, we don't necessarily see it. I went back. I think I might have shared it on Twitter. If I didn't, I will. But uh, the Gaethje fight against Kevin Kroom. Kevin Kroom. Pick a hairstyle in that fight. He's got like he's got like ago. a little boy coconut head hairstyle in that one. Gaethje, I mean, he he's in an armbar, picks up Kroom, slams him, knocks him out. So crazy in that one. But when you look at this one, Matt, a couple of guys that don't know a boring fight. This is my big problem with Justin Gaethje in the matchup. I love the light kicks. I like the counters. His defense is the same in all of his fights. Fiziev is a great striker technique-wise. But what is really his X factor? And uh, I think it was Luke Thomas who did the Fidel versus Fidel? Or, sorry, Fiziev versus Riddell knockout where he broke it down. Fiziev's a really smart striker, like a really smart striker, to where he is outthinking a lot of his opponents. And I do worry about Gaethje's defense being so stationary because what does he do? Puts his hands up, ducks a lot, and just kind of eats the shots. What does he leave wide open? His body. What is Fiziev arguably better than anyone we've seen in the last like five or six years in MMA at doing? He throws boxing combinations to the body and he'll stay dedicated to that body attack. And I think the body shots are going to be a huge X factor. I really want you guys to watch for it because I think that's going to be the story of this fight. Because how did Fiziev knock out Moicano? I know a lot of people think about the right hand that knocked him out, but it was the left hook to the body. He closes the range and he knocks him out with the right hook. I think that combination is going to be open for Fiziev in this matchup. Now... Are there going to be insane consequences if he does leave himself open? If he does make a mistake against a guy like Gaethje? Of course there's insane consequences, like you bring up. He has absurd power in both of his hands, which is really rare. We see a lot of guys who have good power from just their right hand or left hand. Gaethje has it from both and with his knees, so this should be a fight of the night if everything breaks right. I just worry about Gaethje's defense against a guy like Fazeev, because I think Fazeev's going to go to the body a lot in this matchup. It's got to be weird for Fazeev's coaches, too, because you see, what was it, Frank Hickman was on Embedded, and Hickman brothers used to be at Tiger Muay Thai, and then they opened up their own gym at Bang Tao, so you got the Tiger Muay Thai guy training with the old Tiger Muay Thai guy. It's got to be a little bit weird for them. For Gaethje, I mean, you got one half of the co-main event out of Onyx Labs. You got the one half of the main event out of that same gym in Kamaru Usman. Trevor Whitman is there. So really eager to see what we get out of a game plan in this one. At Fight Night Picks, the total vote on our Instagram. 62% going with Fazeev in the though. matchup. The odds in the fight, uh, you do have Fazeev is the favorite at about a minus 240. Justin Gaethje, the comeback as the underdog. I mean, Gaethje. 10-0 with World Series. Fight of the years with Luis Palomino. 6-4 and four in the UFC. A couple of fight of the years already and one that was fringe. Um, yeah, he's had a wild ride. I do have Fazeev in the matchup. But if Justin Gaethje finally shows up with the wrestling shoes, I, I, that would be... Like, I, will, I would lose my mind. Lose I don't my think mind. he's going... Like, we brought up... I don't think a lot of guys, when they fight Justin Gaethje, are like, hey, we got to train wrestling six days a week. Like... He might talk about it in an interview every now and then, but if it walks like a tuck and duck... A tuck? It, I cannot talk Giving right him now. that tuck, tuck If sound. it walk and talks like a duck, it probably is a duck. And Justin Gaethje has primarily become a boxer at this stage of his career. I know he throws great body kicks or great leg kicks too, but we just don't see it at the forefront of his game. He has good takedown defense. I will give him that. I just don't think we're going to see that offensive side of his wrestling. You, uh, you fizzled on that one at the start of the week too. What? If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck... Walk and talk rhyme, though, Craig, so it's easier to get out. Walking like a talk at my Leon Edwards uh, at the, the pre-fight presser. Kamar Usman, what about those three rounds? What are you doing, guy? Like, you got knocked out in the fight. That was I, a silly, silly well, argument. No, you can't... I'm gonna disagree. That's like the commenters just, like, looking at the result, not watching the whole video. You gotta look at how you got to that result, though. Kamar Usman did win three rounds. He was super dominant with his wrestling. All of those things ring true in this fight. I don't know why. It was just a silly one in front of a crowd to try and go after it. Now, Leon Edwards, fifth round head kick, willing himself to the win. Coach is talking about it, round four, round five. And there we go. Now, Kamar Usman gets another crack. His long time on a beaten streak it is now over. And in this trilogy matchup, yes, in the first fight, Kamaru Usman all over it. Like, he he was incredibly dominant. Kind of looked like that first bit against Masvidal. We're going to take him down. We're going to hold him down. We're going to operate from the guard and go after it. You look at this matchup, Matt, and for Edwards, he's gained in confidence. You can see that throughout oh, fight yeah. week. He's not as quiet. He's not as reserved. He's kind of feeling the love, and he gets to fight at home in this one. And for Usman, gets to go over to the UK to get it going. So, you have a look at it, Matt. And when you consider this fight... 
I mean, we, we've seen kind of crazy title fight wins. You think of the one, I mean, Yuri Prohoshka, fifth round against Glover Teixeira. You think of uh, Alex Pereira taking on, again, Adesanya for what seems like the, the well, that was the third time. And in this matchup here, I mean, Usman trying to get the belt back against Leon Edwards. Does it have to be grappling quick and easy? I think it does. Because, again, I brought it up with Joanne Wood earlier on the card. At a certain point, there is just so much film out there on you. And for Kamaru Usman, even when I went back and watched, like, the knockout against Masvidal, that's not, like, great technique. He just threw a right hand down the middle, and Masvidal made a huge mistake by trying to throw a check left hook at the wrong time. And, yes, that technique had hurt Masvidal one time before that, but still. It's not like Usman's going out there and peppering guys with a jab, throwing hooks to the body. His the jab's gotten better. The jab is great, but... The flow to his striking isn't necessarily there. He is a good boxer, but a stiff boxer. And I think that's fair to say. Like, when Usman was talking about how, hey, I might go fight Canelo, that would just be so terrible. And it Ronda would look, Rousey, she can fight the guys. It would be the worst thing for the sport of MMA, though. Let's just come out and be very honest about that. But I, br I watched this so many times. Did you watch that Wonderboy Thompson clip where he's on his Twitch channel and he's watching the Edwards-Usman fight, or at least clips of Usman leading up to that, and he's like, man, he keeps on ducking his head. He keeps on ducking his head. If Edwards throws a kick here, he can catch him with it. And of course, we all know how that fight ended. So I really do think this fight, you bring it up. Does Usman have to just go out there and go for the takedown? I think it's going to be more interesting to see how Leon Edwards fights in the early going of this fight. Because if he does fight with that confidence and allows himself to throw his hands and his combinations, it might be a long night for Usman who finds himself on the back foot, really trying to decipher the attack of Edwards before he can go in for his takedowns. But... Edwards does need space to get a lot of his techniques off. He's not a guy like Max Holloway who's just going to go out there and from the get-go he's kind of burning as hot as he can, throwing a lot of volume. He does take time to set up some of those bigger splashes that he does have. And I think in that time where he's setting them up, that's when Usman go for a takedown. Use the jab like you talk about. And you hate to say this, but I do think if Usman makes this fight a little bit stale, it will help him win it. I do think he's going to fight in a similar way to that first Masvidal fight. And it is a tricky one because, again, for Leon Edwards, you focus in on some of these fights. And we just watched that Donald Cerrone fight where he goes really hard, really early. Good combos. Busts him up. And, yeah, great combinations. Mixing in the kick to the body. Throwing it as a bit of a roundhouse, but also a teat because Donald Cerrone, is he susceptible to the body kick? Is you would say so. So you have a look at Leon Edwards in that fight. You talked about the Peter Sabata fight as well, where he's able to just have tons and tons of And he of looks good for this grappling. That's the thing about Leon Edwards that does get overshadowed. He is, it's a fight against RDA. Uh, he was great in that one too, but the thing is, RDA had got out wrestled quite a few times at 170 by that point. You're right, because Leon Edwards doesn't necessarily have the background of RDA, but in the Sabata fight, like, he just held wrist control, got on top of him, like, did all of the X's and O's kind of perfectly, and those are the types of opponents that you have to beat in that way for people to have real confidence in you fighting ranked competition. Anaconda squeeze MMA. Leon's going to surprise Usman again. Usman keeps mentioning about the first fight, wants to make an excuse for the last fight. Bro got knocked out cold, and I I believe Leon could do it again. Matt, 60% of the fans here in the YouTube chat are going with Pretty Usman close, to get the win. 40% with Edwards. A lot closer than the last time. Matt, fight night picks with question mark kicks. As you folks know, if this isn't the first time, I will tell you. We go all the way back down through the fight. We offer up those final picks and predictions. Nothing changed at the end of this week. The last time something changed, what was it? Did anything change for you last week? I keep thinking the Brandon Allen, Andre Muniz fight. But other than that... Ha does your arm ever get tired? No, 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 no. But I think wow. there might have been a change here recently. But other than that, Matt, we don't uh, we don't like to do it all that often. The first fight that's on the card, Juliana Miller taking on Veronica Hardy. This is a trap card type of fight. Hardy coming off a long layoff. Miller as well, not as long, but from last summer winning the Ultimate Fighter. I am Miller ever so slightly, but if Hardy goes around the outside and, does, and is just able to touch, 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 touch and wins a volume decision, it would not surprise me in the least. Hard to say considering both fighter ceilings, but I have Miller. All right, Matt. Both of us going with Miller. Next one, Herbert versus Klein. Ever so slightly with Klein in the matchup. I have Klein, but this should be a wild fight. Oh, a couple of striker strike, Matt. Uh, Joanne Wood taking on Luana Carolina, going with Carolina. I also have Carolina. All right. In the next one, we have Jake Hadley taking on Malcolm Gordon. Going with Jake Hadley. Also have Jake Hadley. That's a tough stylistic one for Malcolm Gordon. Do you think somebody will ever say, hey, Jake, change the nickname, buddy. Like White Kong, kind of lame. All right, next fight, Matt. Uh, we have Christian Leroy Duncan taking on Disco Todorovic. Going with Christian Leroy Duncan. Aiden, as loud as he can. Y'all sleeping on Leon Edwards. 
Not sleeping on him, guy. Matt, Duncan versus Todorovic. Uh, I have Duncan, but this should be a wild fight. Should be a wild fight. Murphy taking on Santos. I'm going Gabriel Santos here. I like Murphy for the jab. Uh, Gabriel and Murphy. Matt, we have Mohamed Makayev, Jafel Filio going with Makayev. I like Makayev in the matchup. All right, Matt. In our next fight, we have Patterson versus Ash Mose. Going with Patterson in the fight. I also have Patterson. Interested to see what they match him up with after this fight if he is able Both to Both guys, really. Both, Both guys. guys. Uh, Chris Duncan taking on Omar Morales. Going with Omar Morales. I have Duncan, but this isn't going to be a close fight. It's a close fight on paper, but the result will not be close by the time it's over. All right. Then we have Jack Shore taking on Makwan Mirkani. Going with Jack Shore. I like Shore, but again, interested to see how he looks in the new division. All right. Marvin Vittori taking on Roman Delidze. Going with Roman Delidze. I've got the Italian dream. Just stop talking bad about other people's food. They're trying their best. Jennifer Maya is taking on Casey O'Neill. I'm going with Jennifer Maya. I like O'Neill in the matchup. I just think her wrestling is going to be a little bit too dominant. Not that Maya is a bad grappler, but she's not Fabrizio over Doom. So I think it'll be tough. Nobody's Fabrizio over Doom. No one is. Uh, Gunnar Nelson taking on Brian Barabarina. Going with Gunnar Nelson. Bam Bam is going to make it a fun fight. I can guarantee you that much, but I do have Gunnar Nelson. All right, Matt. Co-main event. Fazeev taking on Gaethje. Going with Adaman. Out of Tiger Muay Thai, Fazeev. I have Fazeev. Curious to see what happens if he does win this. Because for Gaethje, he's reached that point where he's just kind of fought a lot of the guys in the top 10, top 5 especially. So, I no idea what happens to Gaethje after this. But if Fazeev wins, you could see a Poirier matchup. That'd be a really fun fight. I think Islam, he might need one more win to really get there. But really, Fazeev against any of those top 5 guys would result in incredible fights. Alright, and then in the main event, Matt... Kamaru Usman taking on Leon Edwards going with Usman in the trilogy fight. I have Usman, but I think this is fair to say. Like at the 205 division, a lot of people question whether or not uh, Jamal Hill is like a championship caliber fighter. I know that's a weird thing to say, but it's a real conversation. Is hey, is he really the best fighter in his division? Because there's a lot of guys who are all kind of at his level right now. We're just kind of figuring out who's the best. Leon Edwards is at this level, without a doubt. Like, it was Colby Covington and Usman, and then everybody else for the longest time. Gilbert Burns kind of snuck in there the, for a little the bit. The win streak's wild for Leon but Edwards. But exactly, Leon Edwards has more than justified his place amongst the elite in the division. Even if he loses this fight, he better fight like Covington or Bilal again, like one of those huge matchups next. I wouldn't be surprised if Leon is able to kind of do what boxing fighters say. You win that title, you get 30% better with the new confidence, but... I have and new with Kamara Usman. I think he's going to get the belt back. Matt, it is a big time week. And then, I mean, coming up in the next one, if I can get the video. There we go. Now we got it. Vera versus Sandhagen. That that's the next one that's coming up next weekend. That'll probably be Tuesday when the video drops. So make sure you're ready for the Tuesday drop of Vera versus Sandhagen. Is that not a mirror matchup in the best way possible? Like, you have two guys who, yes, they can get it done on the ground. Yes, they can mess around with their submissions. Marlon Vera and Corey Sandhagen have devastating striking, and it is all picture-perfect technique. They can switch stances. That's going to be such a fun fight, too. And the thing about it is, there's not even a little, there's not even a 1% part of me that thinks it's going to be a boring fight. Those are two aggressive fighters who really come out and try to set the stage, so I think that's a fun, fun fight. Should be a fun fight. A lot of really interesting matchups on that one as well. Make sure you stay tuned with Fight Night Picks. If you're not already subscribed, you, you hit the subscribe button, then you know when that video drops coming up this week you toss us a like on these videos much appreciated everybody that hit up the super chat thank you we thank you so much ufc 286 an early card here on this saturday some big time fights to look forward to make sure you keep it locked in with fight night picks matt as we always say let's, let's get, get into, into it, it.